Welcome in to another edition of the JMU Sports News Podcast. I'm Bennett Conlon, joined by Jack Fitzpatrick. And the Dukes, the men's basketball team, they're building a roster. Yeah, and that was a very important thing to do because uh, a roster is something that as of 15 hours ago, they really didn't have. Still got a long way to go, but they're getting there, folks. (laughs) They still have seven scholarships to fill. Like, that's a lot of scholarships. That's a lot of scholarships. They added two transfers. We'll get into that in a second. But Preston Spradlin, working behind the scenes. He's working. He's working. And Don Alexander drops. How are the other Sunbelt schools doing in the portal? Uh, App State, they lost a lot. They've gained a couple guys back, though. Um, Hodgson at Arkansas State has had a good add. But overall, not a lot coming out of the other schools. Hey, I haven't seen a ton, but I'll be honest, I haven't, you know, paid a ton of attention. I usually check sort of as teams are filling out rosters, not necessarily during to see like what's coastal up to mid portal. Yeah. Kind of like to look when it's settled. Coastal did lose a key piece to Charlotte. They also lost a stud to Duquesne, I think, right? Like Meyer, whoever was Yeah. Yeah. So Coastal's been hit hard, but they have Justin Gray at head coach. I think he'll do some nice stuff there eventually. Yes. Um you know who else is doing nice stuff? Oh. Our friends over at Bet Online, because they're your number one source for all of your summer sports this season. MLB, golf, NBA, NHL playoffs, all of the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow for your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to get on the action. Bet online where the game starts, and whoever's been making those should really proofread them next time. Some typos? Oh, lots of. Ty- Do you want me to read you that first line? What it's what yeah. it's supposed to say? Yeah. Bet online is your number one source for all your summer sports this season, from MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL playoffs stats. Hmm. <laughs> Just throw in your stats. <laughs> Just throw stats. Just stats. Um, and also stats. doing a great job is um, ourselves. That might sound arrogant, but that was the only way to segue that. Uh, over the only, at Jamie's, the only way to do it. <laughs> over at jamiesportsnews.com, you can follow up, uh, follow and stay up to date with all things happening in the transfer portal, football, coaching staff, spring stuff happening. I believe Daniel Merriman uh, may be at the game covering the spring game, breaking all of that down, giving you a live uh, – live takeaways from the game itself should be a fun time. That spring game is April 20th for JMU football, but all of that can be found on JMU sports news.com. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you, Bennett. (laughs) That's exactly right. Give us a like, give us a subscribe. We love those if you're on YouTube. And I I do want to apologize for saying that Shane Lowry is going to win the masters. (laughs) Yeah. That's all I mean. Let's start at the top. Yes. Shane Lowry was never really in contention. No. Made the cut, which we love to see for the big guy, but uh, yeah, never in contention. At least he wasn't Hatton. Do you see all the hate Terrell Hatton was getting? He's a bit of a lunatic. Yeah, he, he very much is. He very much. I think he threw his ball into the pond at one point because he was mad about a putt. 
that checks out. He was, I saw some stuff that he was spitting at one point, like on his own ball, which people yeah. were offended by. <laughs> All right. Neil at Shipley, least, though, none of that. Neil Shipley, none of that. Zach Johnson, definitely none of that. Zach Johnson doesn't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is screaming. Everyone comes to the Jamie Sports News Podcast, the Transfer Portal Mania edition for our Masters breakdown. Golf pod. Scotty Scheffler is too good at golf right now. He's an unbelievable player. All right, should we get into, should we get into the portal? <laughs> yeah, let's let's get into some Transfer Portal Mania. Transfer Portal open for football. We'll talk a little bit football later on in this podcast, but we're going to start at the top with the two big additions for JMU men's basketball, one of them being a 6'7 rising sophomore forward for Moorhead State, Eddie Ricks the third. JMU also adds a 6'6 junior guard from Syracuse, Justin Taylor. We'll break down Eddie Ricks first, go into some Justin Taylor, and then kind of talk overall roster construction and what we think Preston Spradlin will do as time moves on. But First reaction to seeing Eddie Ricks join the Dukes from the portal. Yeah, so we're dorks. I think a lot of people listening are dorks, so kind of had this on our radar, right? Because he's a Moorhead State player that was in the portal. Really talented. He's a good defender. He led them in blocks as a forward, which I thought was impressive because they did have a true big uh, 39 seven block. footer. Yeah, they had a seven-footer that was not Eddie Ricks. So Ricks had 39 blocks, good defender. I think he averaged seven and a half points a game, decent score. Rebounds were right around five. A solid player, not the most lethal scorer through one season, but definitely has some offensive game, but probably didn't do enough at Moorhead State to command a lot of like P5 offers. But he fits really well with Preston Spradlin having played for him and, and being a really good defender, which is kind of what Spradlin seems to care the most about. Yeah, you mentioned it. Not a great shooter. 41.6% from the floor, 30.6% from behind the arc, 61% from the free throw line, did average about five rebounds per game. So that's kind of what his role is. He played primarily the four for Preston Spradlin this past season, and he was kind of a day one impact player for Moorhead State, getting a lot of minutes, 27 minutes in the very first game that he appeared in. And really, that was kind of his M.O. for the remainder of the year. He scored in double digits 10 times, a season high of 21. Uh, I mean, but like you said, he, he is kind of more of a defensive player. He's going to alter shots. Think Justin Absin, but maybe not as elite. He was 263rd in the nation in block percentage, getting a block on 4% of opponents' offensive possessions. I'm excited about the addition. I also think getting a guy who's only played one season of college basketball, his potential feels really high, right? He's a really good defender. He showed some moves. If you go watch some of like his highlight tapes, he does have offensive moves and seems confident shooting the three. Um, Jamie's had plenty of guys who are confident shooting the three that don't make a ton, but I think there's potential there for him to, to make more threes, to be a bigger offensive threat. But the main thing, and I think this is the big thing. You got to keep the main thing, the main thing. You got to keep the main thing the main thing. You got to keep the standard the standard. I think my guess would be Preston Spradlin would like JMU to be the most efficient defense in the Sun Belt. And that's like priority number one. And I think Ricks is going to help with that. Yeah. Both of the moves in the portal today show that we, we can jump to Justin Taylor and then kind of hop between both of them because they added Justin Taylor as I'm trying to find the correct lower third. He's a 6'6 junior guard from Syracuse, was the second best defender on the orange this past season, according to Evan Maya. Offensively, he took a, a pretty huge step back from his freshman year to his sophomore year. Could that be because he played an entirely new position under an entirely new coaching staff? Probably. But it is a little stark that he had such a big jump backwards. But he is a very good defensive player. Yeah, he came out of, of high school, and I guess he finished. He was in Charlottesville for a little bit, but then finished at IMG Academy and was known, I think, like as a shooter, a three-point shooter. His freshman year at Syracuse, he was 39% from three and looked like a really confident shooter. Struggled a lot more this year. I think he was sub-30% from three, at least against D1 teams. He was 30.1% from three on the entire season. So he had a he had a good one against a <laughs> non D one that uh, Ken probably I mean, he did yeah he was two of five against Shamanad in Maui so that's you love to see that but he started every game this year 
for Syracuse, I think largely because of what he can do defensively. So you've added another piece that can defend. You've got Xavier Brown, presumably probably a starting point guard, or at least getting a lot of minutes at point guard. That's a pretty good defensive like trio right there. And you certainly Quincy Allen's got some athleticism. We'll see if Roberson develops and, and gets minutes in the front quarter, if they add other guys in the portal, but they have potential there. And we still don't know what's happening. Like if they get Raquan Horton back, they have like the best defensive group of wings that you could possibly imagine. Yeah. Sideline said Rick's very active player matchup problem for guards and wings. If he can draw, if he can get his shot to drop at a more consistent clip, a huge matchup problem. I, I, I kind of picture him more in that Raquan Horton mold where if he can get that shot where it's like around a 33, 34% shooter, which is what Raquan was this last year. It, it makes people kind of have to respect you, step out a little bit more, and defend you a little harder. But these are two pickups that are going to play that three, that four spot. They're filling it out really well. I think Ricks will probably slot in as the four. Taylor will probably slot in as the three. Xavier Brown will be the one or the two, depending on who they pick up in the portal. Mark Freeman might be coming, the 2023 OVC Player of the Year. Um, we can talk about that too. But I think Taylor has a lot ricks has a lot of potential but am i crazy in thinking that taylor might have more potential no he was a four-star recruit coming out of high school like super talented if he gets the jump shot back given his size ability to defend things like that i mean he was he was playing a ton for syracuse which got itself like toward the bubble at the end of the year i mean they beat north carolina in mid-february and he played 21 minutes for him like that that He's feels also valuable He's also a 6'6 guard, listed as a 6'6 guard, playing the four. And he's like 6'6, 220. Yeah, like yeah. this dude is going to be a matchup nightmare in the Sun Belt. If he can shoot anywhere close to his freshman year number of 39%, heck, if it's a 36% three-point mm -hmm. shooter, but like he's good inside, he may be – an offensive juggernaut in the in the Sun Belt because there's just not a lot of guys that can match up with a 6-6-2-20 guard forward high. It's almost like Terrence Edwards, but a little bigger in terms yeah, of weight. And, and you're going to play slower, right? Offensively, they seem to go slower in with in theory with Spradlin. Syracuse went pretty quick or at least decently fast. I think that could be a benefit to him if they're really selective in their shots, if his three-point attempts are coming like fully set and they're, they're drawing up stuff specifically for him, it could boost that percentage too. So I kind of think they're building a roster that does make sense to go a little bit slower, um, which is going to be a change, but I, I don't know. Defensively, they look like they'll be good, and then we've got it here on our lower third, but his mom played uh, women's basketball at JMU. I think there is something to be said for him, like just wanting to be close to home and probably enjoying being at JMU, which is cool. Yeah, and JMU was one of the first, if not the first, depending on how 247 puts in their offers. Three offers came in on June 12th of 2020, according to 247. First was from JMU. So I'll say JMU was one of the first schools to offer him. June 12th of 2020, that may have been Byington's first recruiting class. So one of the first guys that Byington reached out to and in terms of that recruiting class. Like you said, his mom played at JMU. Mom is now a, a practicing lawyer in Charlottesville. That's where he grew up. It seems that he may have, and I, not to project too much, but like it seems like he may have had maybe a rough sophomore year with a new coach playing a position that wasn't necessarily his true position. He played more of the three in high school, according to 247. So you come back home, try to fix your shot, get a year or two under your belt. Maybe you jump back up to the P5 or you finish out your collegiate career as a kind of JMU potential great player. The upside feels crazy with him, right? Where like, I think like your, your floor is probably like really good defender who can play a bunch of minutes, which is what he did at Syracuse. And then the ceiling would be if he gets the three point shot back, you're looking at somebody who's a really good defender who starts on the wing who like has local ties and just shoots the crap out of it from three. <laughs> I mean, his floor, I mean, his floor <laughs> and his ceiling are both super exciting. I don't know. That feels like one that I, I know people mentioned it like, Oh, he's a local kid. He didn't have a great year at Syracuse in the portal. And yeah. I was like, I don't know. Like, Oh, <laughs> I like the idea. I just didn't think it was like realistic. I yeah. thought he would want to play at a, a place that was better. I honestly thought he had a, like UVA might look into him. 
Um, so to get him at, at James. UVA so. did offer him back out of high school, so they may have even looked into him. But Preston Spradlin may have given him the pitch. You might be our offensive guy. If we don't get Mark Freeman, you <laughs> might be the guy. He's got a chance to be the guy for sure, or at least like one of the top two guys because of how much they lost. I don't know. I'm starting to like the the portal class. Now they've got a lot of needs left. A lot of needs left. Or was, Good was segue. That? It was a Sycamore Mango Chronic. If you're in the uh, Charlotte, North Carolina area, I highly recommend. Sycamore that sounds pretty beer. good. Um, I also recommend Three Notch Beer if you're in the Virginia area. That well said. Great segue into this part of the podcast. They've lost a lot. They still have seven scholarships oh, yeah. to hand out. Mark Freeman did drop a little bit of an interesting, maybe I'm reading too much into it. I might be, I very well could be, but Mark Freeman reposted Eddie Ricks on Instagram with the caption copy handshake at Eddie Ricks. <laughs> That's right. After he announced his transfer. So maybe Mark Freeman's on his way and he's a bucket. He's a bucket getter. I think that one. App, App State Cone Enforcer agrees with Sycamore. Mango Chronic is a great brew. Yeah, I think uh, well, that's well said. But I also I also think Mark Freeman would be a, a huge pickup because he's a guy who shoots a lot from three. His last year at Moorhead State, he was injured this, this past season. But before that, 37%. The year before that at Illinois State, 37% from three, at least against D1 teams. Big time score. He's small at 5'11, but he can fill it up. For a team that seems like is adding good defender, good defender, good defender, having somebody that could fill it up would be good. Yeah, I would. I would. If Mark Freeman came, I would get way too excited about this team, even with six scholarships. That's remaining. what's so exciting, right? I let myself do this. I remember when when this whole transfer process started. I went, I'm not gonna, let, I'm not gonna let myself buy in too much. They hired Preston Sprad. Then I think my first text to you was, I'm not blown away. And then I researched him more and more, and I was like, I'm so excited. And then I saw the transfers leave, and Jalen Carey goes to Vanderbilt. Terrence Edwards goes to Louisville. We all knew he was leaving, but, like, you see these things start to come in. And I was like, okay, they're going to add really good guys on paper that I'm going to be able to talk myself into. I'm not going to let myself get too excited. Here we are, two transfers in, and I'm like, if they can add Mark Freeman, this team's winning the national championship. They're going to be a scrappy mid-major, like at, at minimum. They're already building like a core, a core that's better than like, I mean, they had some teams like in the Matt Brady era and maybe even the Lou Rowe era that like this. One, oh, oh, <laughs> I'm telling you, I think Mark Freeman. <laughs> Mark Freeman. I think it's Mark Freeman. <laughs> copy. I'm, I'm going on record. Mark Freeman is going to be the next transfer portal uh, to come through. I think that gets you a lot then because you've got, that's a dangerous backcourt with Freeman and Brown. You then got Ricks. Or Drew Taylor. Thelwell. I know he's going to Miami, that's true. UCF, that's true. Wake Forest, all these teams yeah. that have huge... Basketball schools, right? <laughs> schools that can't compete both on the gridiron and in the hardwood. Yeah. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Oh, you know what they still need, though, even if they do add Mark Freeman? We're back. We're back like two years in the past. Dukes need a big. <laughs> they they have Jerrell Roberson. Okay. Quincy Allen. He's not a big. He's a wing. Yeah. Who do you who do you who do you play at the four or five or at the five right now? Is there like a seven footer who went to IMG Academy who was at a, like a P5, it didn't work out, but they have Did like you say the ties. recent transfer portal edition. No, Tulsa's big man, he's a seven footer, just entered the portal like two hours ago. Is he close? Does he have no. JNU ties? No, not at all. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he's like, in contact <laughs> that's, that's what I always do. I'll go on like evanmaya.com or something and look through the portal because it's got like the whole list. And I'm just like looking at random bigs. I'm like, yo this guy at Cornell could be the dude. And then he will commit to like Virginia tech. I was like, well, that was a waste of my time. <laughs> I'm <laughs> going to look, look, I'm gonna look now. <laughs> Let's see. Portal rankings. Is that where I go? Oh, I got to subscribe. Yeah. You subscribe subscribe. To, I subscribe, you subscribe? To as well. Yeah. It's worth it for the portal stuff. I think I can't okay, remember. Se the, send me your login after this. Yeah, <laughs> I will. I'll play around with it. 
Yeah, but you can but go they, like by position and stuff. It's fine. That's what I was going to I was going to do that live on the podcast and just start naming names. But in all honesty, back to back on the back on the rails here. Um they definitely need a big still. They need guard depth. And at this point, they kind of just need overall depth because as it stands mm-hmm. right now, they're starting five if the season started tomorrow. Xavier Brown Why did I just completely blank? Xavier Brown, the two would be. I think we went like super small in our projected one on the internet. And we had like Taylor at the two. I did do that, didn't I? It was like Taylor, Allen, Ricks or Ricks, Allen. That's right. To get all the scholarships on the court. I went Xavier, Justin Taylor, Eddie Ricks, uh, Quincy Allen, Joel Roberson. And then the bench would be Red Thompson, the freshman who just recommitted. Recommitted, yeah. Uh, McKeon, Fett, Feeden, and Pope. Those last three are the walk-ons. Walk-ons, yeah. They got a lot of scholarships left. So every D1 school gets 13 scholarships. They have seven remaining to hand out. A lot. Now, you don't have to give out all of your scholarships, but it would be kind of foolish not to. You'll at least get close. Like sometimes they'll leave one or two for walk ons that have like worked hard if you want to go with like an eight man rotation or something, which is the other thing. I think we've gotten used to Mark Byington running out like 11. For the first yeah, that's a very season. good point. Spradlin might actually like do what most college coaches do and have like an eight or nine man rotation. I think that's probably more realistic than the uh, the Mark Byington ten that then gets kind of compressed to eight or nine, but he'll still like throw the tenth guy in sometimes. My guess is that Spradlin's got himself a tighter tighter group, group especially yeah. if you're not paying, playing that fast. Agreed. I, I'm su- I'm excited for this team though. I, I think. Whoever comes in next, Mark Freeman or another guy or a few bigs, this team has the potential to to really make some noise in the Sun Belt again. I mean, you hire a guy who seems like he can really coach, and now you start to have all these good portal ads. Jeff Bourne and company, you've done it again. Not to kind of to veer off in a different direction here after shouting out Jeff Bourne, by all means. <laughs> Were you shocked to see Justin Taylor come in? Because I was expecting Division Two NAIA low major guys just to come through the po- guys I had never heard of, and then when I saw a Syracuse transfer, a, a Syracuse starter who was in the portal come to JMU, and I understand all of his local ties, but that that still took me by surprise. It gives off obviously different position, like the Bickerstaff vibes. It where it's like, I was oh, thinking this- that. I was thinking that an ACC guy coming to the Sun Belt to just beat up on him. It kind of, yeah, it's like that where bigger staff, like his ACC stats weren't crazy. And you're like, oh, that guy's going to eat in the Sun Belt. <laughs> That's kind of <laughs> how I feel about Taylor. It's like, it's just, it's a significantly lower competition level than the ACC. Like he should be able to do a lot, both offensively and defensively. I think he's going to regress positively to the mean be a solid three point shooter, play the three and just be like a really good player. Yeah. That one I, I'm ex- <laughs> I'm super excited for him. Like I, when he first get it, when he first committed and I had just seen his, I just saw his like sophomore year stats. I was like, this guy, what are we doing? A defensive menace. Come on. That's all he does. And then I was looking at his splits and I was like, Oh, this dude's legit. Yeah, and I think with with Spradlin, I guess I've I've maybe even been doing him um, a little bit unfair with sort of describing. I do think he's prioritizing defense for sure, but like Morehead State was actually a little bit more efficient offensively than defensively. They were 123rd offensively, 129th defensively. I don't know. They could just be really good on both ends. I think they might be very good. I guess the the concern I have, I'm curious your thoughts here. Last year, there was some returning core, Edwards yeah. specifically, and Friedel and Wooden, who were all just massive pieces in the And Brown Xavier. Had, yeah, he was a big piece as well. It's going to be, it seems like at least, right, a very really transfer-heavy rotation, so they won't have played together a ton. You might have multiple Moorhead State players based on some of the, the Instagram activity you're monitoring. Uh, so maybe some chemistry there. 
but is I don't know, is that going to be a challenge to kind of get it all to gel together? So I'm going to look up a stat while I'm trying to figure out this point. I'm going to throw a question back at you. Oh. Do you think it's almost not bad, but difficult that if they do bring over Mark Freeman and they have Eddie Ricks and they have their former coach, that then that core that is there, the Xavier Brown, the Jarrell Roberson, and Quincy Allen, they feel almost like this is our team, but now we're almost outnumbered by the other team. I don't think so. Does that does I, that thought process make sense, or am I just like saying you, something? It, they definitely have to? It has to be one where like you got to get them to gel off the court, right? So that you have sort of agreement on what's going on. But I think with the portal, it makes it easier because I guess in years past, if you didn't have the portal, you could just wallow sort of on your team and be frustrated that you have a new coach and and well, I guess you wouldn't have different players, but you could have some different players. Maybe they're a grad transfer. I think in this case, like Brown deciding to stay means he's bought into what Spradlin is doing. And then I don't know that Allen and Roberson were like, they didn't necessarily play a ton. So I think for them, I imagine they'd be down for whatever the new coach is offering because it'll give them a chance possibly to play. I think it definitely fits Roberson's style a little more. I think he would make sense and sort of a slow it down, be deliberate with what you're doing. So I think there are actually a lot of benefits to it. I also think Brown specifically seems like he's very coachable and not a huge ego and sort of almost becoming like the face of the team yeah. where I think he'd be down to like share the spotlight with people. Cause he did that a lot this year. I, I agree. I just kind of wanted to throw that back at you so you could cover while I was doing some math. I, I also think if you're looking at Xavier Brown's Instagram story, I was really all over social media today. He was showing a lot of love to Eddie Ricks and Taylor today, just like hyping them up, congratulating them, welcoming them into JMU essentially. So he, he is being that face of JMU. I think he's going to do a really good job of being the elder statesman of the team and helping kind of usher in this Bradlin era. As it stands right now, JMU returns 12.6% of their minutes from last year. They only had one guy who's returning this year play more than a hundred minutes. Xavier Brown, blah, 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 blah. Xavier Brown played 760 minutes last season. Next closest was Quincy Allen with 57 minutes played. Jarrell Roberson with 54. Shane Feeden, Jarrell Pope, and Aiden McKeon uh, played 23, 16, and 11 respectively. It says a lot about the blowouts at the walk-ons for logging some minutes. <laughs> Good sure. For them. Good for them, man. But they they really only return Xavier Brown. That's their only experience. In it's terms of like big moments, mm -hmm. big games, how you play the Sun Belt, how the games are officiated. There's I'm gonna say it now so that when I am inevitably upset when they're sitting at four games above 500 after blowing like three games early on in the season. I'm going to tell myself now that it's going to take some time for them to mesh together, that the start of Sunbelt play might be a little bit difficult, but I think they'll get it together and be really, I think they're going to be playing their best basketball as the season rolls on February, March, January, February, March, 2025 was when we're going to see this team really come together. Yeah, they've got a chance, too, with some of them, right? Where Brown, Taylor, Ricks, multiple years of eligibility. So, obviously, the portal's crazy where they could all leave again. But if you could keep them for, for two seasons, it would be you know phenomenal. Billy Matthews Jr. was Taylor and Xavier Brown recruit. He said he had some high-character guys in mind for transfers. I wouldn't be shocked if they knew of each other and they kind of had a pre-existing relationship. Uh, because Xavier Brown played his high school ball in the 757 area. Shane, it's Shane Taylor. Um, that is a second baseman for Charlotte. Justin Taylor. <laughs> Justin Taylor played his high school ball in Charlottesville. So they may have kind of crossed paths, maybe on the AAU circuit. I wouldn't say it was a necessarily an Xavier Brown recruit, but what Xavier posted on Instagram, I think they have a connection. I think they have a relationship. Yeah, I also think too. You mentioned it Daniel was like Merriman. The Sorry to interrupt you. X and Taylor played together at one point. Well, there you go. And Thank they, you. um, with the lack of returners and guys, just sort of on campus. Uh, Taylor visited. I think when other transfers will visit too. I imagine 
Brown is kind of in their ear at some point, in addition to the coaches. Classic. So, <laughs> yeah. But I think once you start to get some guys going, there is sort of with every team in the country too, it's not a JMU exclusive, but you have like the, the camaraderie and the idea of like, Hey, if we can add a couple more transfers, I think there is that unselfishness of like, we could win the Sun Belt again, play in an NCAA tournament, be really good in front of like rowdy home crowds. So yeah, I think they've got a chance to, to really put together a stellar portal class. And I also think Preston Spradlin maybe did a little uh, underselling over delivering in his, his intro press conference when he's like, yeah, I just look for these unheralded guys. <laughs> Like Justin Taylor, the ACC starter who was a four star, is your unheralded guy that you have? The, the 17th best player in Florida who played his <laughs> final year of high school ball at IMG. Yeah, the unheralded guy. That's like Zach Eady saying that he was unheralded coming out of IMG. Yeah, <laughs> very funny. But yeah, that, that's basketball. It's I'm a good portal hall so far. Good portal hall. Lots more to come, though. Seven yeah. more scholarships to hand out. Still need rim protection, bigs in general. Maybe they can get Mark Freeman and get kind of a guy that can put up points in a hurry, be lethal from the three-point line. But as it stands right now, they're getting an A from me. If they get Freeman and like a true, I'm if they get Freeman, I don't big. if they get Freeman, oh. I don't care what else they do. I will be so stupid on this podcast. They get yeah, they got a chance to be special if they get mark freeman man i'm gonna be pumped eddie ricks playing the four mark freeman playing the the one two three four would be good then they'd have to add out some like good depth pieces and that might be when his naia d2 experience comes in i do want to have an update on a guard that i brought up like a month ago in the transfer yeah, we lost, i saw that <laughs> Dayton Albury, the Queens transfer, is going to Utah State, and I was really sad when I saw that news come across. <laughs> yeah, I saw, I saw Nick tweeting about that, and he was like, "Best downhill guard in the country." He is. I was like, "This is just a throwback to the <laughs> the podcast." Charlotte uh, boys, Queens, Queens University of Charlotte, baby. Um, go Royals, Royals rise. So that brings us to JMU football. Spring game right around the corner. Five wow. days away. Five, count them. One, two, three, four, five days away to the JMU football spring game. What are you looking for in this game? What storylines do you want to see come out of it? Interested to see how close Chesney gets to naming Morris the starting quarterback or if we're going to do that whole thing again in the fall. No, we better not. Um, <laughs> it kind of seems like he's going to be the guy based off of how he was talking um, after the first scrimmage, but then also just like our brains, right? I came from Washington. He probably didn't come to be the backup. He started at a Pac-12 school. Like we can piece that together. Outside of that, I kind of want to see if Chesney names any specific people. Uh, cause he hasn't done that in practices, but I imagine given the fact that the spring game will be open, there will be questions and also people seeing like, Hey, that guy's pretty good. And I wonder <laughs> if he'll give a little more like, yeah, that guy's been very good all spring. So if, if we're going to get anything, any morsels from spring ball, probably come in Saturday. What morsels are you expecting? Any morsels Dylan Morris, QB one. Are you expecting? I don't know what other position is there like a, a necessarily big competition for a lot of questions of receiver of like who's gonna who's gonna step up i know he's happy with the receivers potential 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 but at the same time i'm gonna try to calm myself a little bit with spring game updates too because in the past i've overreacted to them a lot where they'll be like troy lewis is cooking at receiver and i'm like wow Troy Lewis is the guy. And then he's like wide receiver nine. And the same yeah. happened. Jaden Mines, I think, caught a touchdown pass in a spring game. And I was like, this could be the year. And then it's just like. Who was who was the – we did the breakout potential candidates like two or three. When I was at the – what year was it? I was like going into the 22 season. I we did Josh break, Sims like every year. <laughs> we did breakout. <laughs> I just like Josh Sims though. <laughs> I met Josh Sims at the Georgia State game. Yeah, he's Great super guy. nice. <laughs> super he's like, good guy. Yeah, I know. I was like, yeah, that guy. I love that guy. There was – I forget who the, the the wide receiver was, but I was like, 
been at what? And you're like, he's going to be really good. And I don't think he saw a snap all season. (laughs) (laughs) It keeps happening. So I think my main takeaway from this is like, don't take too much away. Because also being a dog in April doesn't do you a lot of good. Like you got to be a dog in August and then in September. But also remember when we thought that like Surratt was wide receiver like four in (laughs) September. And then we watched a game or two and we're like, oh, yeah, (laughs) he's a stud. So I I feel like it's one that there's going to be a lot of movement across positions going into the fall. Daniel Merriman said, I'll be asking a lot of safety questions. Shameless plug. Safety Big question mark. You got Jacob Thomas, and outside of that, even Jacob Thomas is a question mark. You got a lot of freshmen coming in. KJ Flow, Mr. Levy said, I expect KJ Flow to be a huge, be huge at nickel for the white team. Um, <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> sure, Mr. Levy, do you know that if they're, are they doing purple and white? Is it purple and gold this year? How are they even doing it? Um, but yeah, a lot of questions at safety. I think we're going to hear him name Jacob Dobbs as linebacker one. I don't, that's why I will say, I I need less of like those storylines of like Dobbs loves football. Chesney loves competition. We know like that's good. Check that box. All right. It's been checked. Um, here's what we don't need. We don't need who cornerback one and two are because it's D'Angelo Pons and Chauncey Logan. I don't need to know. It's like my dream, man. I know. And we don't need (laughs) linebacker talk because we know it's going to be Jacob Dobbs and Torrance Torres Jones. You can maybe ask one linebacker question: Who's starting next to <laughs> next to Jacob Dobbs? You could do Hendrick or or uh, Raymond could, Scott from the portal. Maybe I forgot about Raymond Scott. <laughs> I forgot about him. So maybe the they, portal hall was big. Well, I've, I what I'm actually very intrigued in seeing is what defense they run. Are they going to run a three, three, five stack that we saw Signetti in Houston? I forgot which coat. They all blend together in my mind. One of them I ran a three, three, five. They all did some stack. multiple stuff. Signetti yeah. was doing some fun three, three, five stuff last year when he realized that like his linebackers were so good that they should put three of them on the field at times. Yeah. So I, I wonder if that's going to be incorporated. Something like what is Lyle Hemphill's overall philosophy? He's a defensive back guy. So is Chesney. So are they going to want a lot of five cornerback set five secondary sets out there. Are you going to run a more traditional four, three? I don't think so. Are you going to run like a two down and then like a two, four something with your two outside linebackers acting as the edge that come in? Like there's a lot of ways you can take it. So I'm really intrigued to see how they set up defensively. Yeah, that'll be a good one to keep an eye on. And then offensively, um, Billy Matthews, very interested to see the D-line starting lineup in the rotations. Same. I don't know how much stock I'm putting into the starting lineup in rotations, though, for the same reason why I can't take too much away from the wide receivers. Would agree with that. I would agree with that. I'm still semi-interested, but some of it, too. Chops. Let's go. Give me Eric O'Neal. <laughs> Basically. Some of it I, I want to see, too, because um, at least with Signetti in the past, there were like a lot of starters that were – not playing in the game and like resting or whatever. I wonder if Chesney takes a similar approach because I know he's been really cautious about keeping them healthy. So something to monitor there is like, are there guys who are clearly going to play that aren't in the rotation because then the rotation becomes less relevant because they'll be factored in in the fall. Yeah. I'm trying to think offensively other than quarterback wide receiver. I'm not really intrigued on offensive line because it should be pretty well set. They got a good group, yeah. Got a good group. And then they're running backs. How fast is Pet away, actually? Would love to see that. Same with a day. A day. I'm just, yeah, I think that all fair points. I, right, we're probably not putting a ton of stock into this game at all. But I'm more so excited for the questions afterwards. I want to see if he says anything about specific people. I'm excited that our guy Daniel Merriman's going to be there. He's going to ask some great questions. He'll give us the inside scoop on what's happening. He'll be if he so chooses live tweeting from Jamie sports news, I would bet money that he's also live tweeting from his own personal. Um, so give him a follow there. And yeah, that's football. Any other big things you're looking to come out of it? Not really. Not really. We still got a long way until, you know, football season. So also the portal is open. That's a good point. 
So we may see some guys jump in, some guys jump out. Still, we could still have a completely new roster by the time football comes around. Yeah, and to Daniel's point about the safeties, might might make sense given the inexperience <laughs> for some some portal additions. We'll see because I thought Chesney would have been more active during the winter on that, but I think he maybe wanted to see what some of the young guys have before testing the portal. Yeah, Terrence Spence, a potential safety. He could play. Yeah, he could. He can move around a DB a hybrid I think. type of guy. Yeah, he's coming Dog. in the summer. Dog, and he's a special teams wizard. Dog. All right, moving from football to a little bit of a sadder one. Baseball drops a series at ODU. Lost on Friday, seven to one. Then one on Saturday, seven to five. But the pitching just couldn't really find its rhythm against a potent Monarchs offense. Losing the rubber match on Sunday, six to three. Not the end of the world. Would have been a nice series win. Will you apologize? No. Okay. Are we, is this going to be the running bit now? Like after, <laughs> after every series, every series. I just wanted to check. Just, geez, just wanted to see where you stood. They've got a, a series, home series coming up against Georgia Southern. That's after a VMI midweek. That, those would be good ones to get. And then at South Alabama, that's a tough series. They got a midweek against Maryland. They got an important stretch coming up here. Then they have series against Arkansas State and Marshall at home. Those teams, I looked it up, they're a combined 6-28 and 28 on the road this year. You got to be sweeping one of those, if not both. Like, you got to be cooking during that. And then they end the year, tough one against Troy at Virginia Tech as well. So uh, they've got important ones coming up. Then they have that lull where they kind of need to beat up on bad teams. Then a tough finish. So bubble boys. They're bubble boys. As it stands right now, yeah. Um, I'm checking on Warren Nolan. They are still 26 in the RPI. Okay. Also, some late breaking breaking news. Daniel Daniel Merriman will be tweeting from the Jamie Sports News account during the spring game. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> You're our last thing got. It wasn't a text I had just read too. <laughs> just wanted everybody to know. Gosh. Yeah, I, I don't have much to say on this. I'm a little surprised you're not apologizing, given the fact that they did take the Saturday game out of you. <laughs> they're they're so much better than I thought they were going to be. The pitching though has been kind of that Achilles heel yeah. for them this season, as it is for most mid major college baseball teams. I should add in that like. Louisiana is a ranked top 25 team out of the Sun Belt because they have just better pitching than everyone else. Like ECU is one of the top teams in the entire nation. You just look at any of the top 25 teams and you will find at least one high end MLB quality starter. Jamie doesn't have that right now. And it's going to bite them in the butt sometimes. Bite them in the bud. Sorry. I just realized I've been saying that saying wrong my entire life. <laughs> I like that, man. You can bite him anywhere. Bite him in the bud. Bite him in the butt. Why is it bite him in the bud? Isn't bite them in the butt more makes it more sense? Bite them in that. Is it bite them or is it nip it in the? <laughs> oh, it's nip them in the butt. <laughs> okay. I'm surprised that it took me so long. <laughs> Wait, so then it's bite you in. It is bite you in the butt then. Yeah. That's but right. it's a nip it in the bud. I believe that's correct. <laughs> All right. This is, this has gone off the rails. <laughs> For today. such an arrogant podcast full of know-it-alls, <laughs> we're so dumb. <laughs> All right, Jamie Softball, they swept Marshall. They swept Marshall. I think Marshall's bad, if I'm not mistaken. But they were, like, taking some some significant deficits. <laughs> they, there was one game they were down, like, 5 nothing, like, late. <laughs> Coming back, getting those wins, good for them. They're having a solid year. I mean, I don't think they're, like, a... NCAA regional team right now with an at large, but they're uh, 24 and 16 RPI. I think they're right around 60. They're hanging in there. They're having fun. You know, they've only got three Sunbelt weekends left before they get into the conference championship. So we're getting toward that time, but they've got a favorable schedule down the stretch could certainly do some damage in the conference standings. They definitely could make some noise in the conference tournament. Scrappy group. Very scrappy. They they don't go away easily. They just need their bats to wake up at times. That's exactly right. 
And last, but certainly not least, probably the saddest of them all. <laughs> Doomsday. Yeah, that's lacrosse been struggling a little bit. They've been struggling against ranked opponents specifically after that opening yeah. season, like thrilling win against UNC. They haven't necessarily been that great. Maybe we kind of took for granted the fact that UNC lost three of their all Americans right before the start of the season. And that wasn't baked into their preseason ranking. Not saying we overhyped lacrosse. Cause I still think they have the talent to be really, really good and make a deep postseason run. But I think us watching that UNC win, seeing the similarities to their national championship year when they beat UNC, maybe we overhyped them just a little bit. They're sitting at 10 and four coming off of a 15 to seven loss, which if I'm not mistaken, is their second worst loss of the year. Yeah, a couple eight goal defeats this year, which is kind of uncharacteristic. For them, I will say the tough part there, all those ranked losses have been on the road. It's tough to play really, really good teams on the road. So that's that's a challenge. But they do have the Mark Byington revenge game on Saturday against Vanderbilt. Stick it to old, old Mark. Do you know what time the spring game is? I think it's like 2.30. So you have time to go to the Vanderbilt game at noon, make it on over to Bridgeforth for the 2.30 kick. 2.30 of the confirmed. 2.30 confirmed kick of the spring game. Have yourself a great JMU weekend. And, uh, yeah. Then they finish out the year at ODU in Norfolk, and then they'll go to Nashville for the AAC championships. Now let's talk a little bit of Neil Shipley. Masters man, low amateur. You didn't put this on the outline. Therefore, there was no lower third for this. Did you see a side eye thing in Butler Cabin? There we go. Yeah. Hilarious. Did you see, did you see <laughs> his was... awkward interaction with the reporter when they were like, What tiger <laughs> hand you? And like he was like, uh, and then everyone's like, Did you see how there's like a conspiracy theory around it now? Like, why did he look at the the I media? That, yeah. And it's just like probably because he's a low AM who's never had to dealt with media at JMU <laughs> or Ohio State and has no clue how to handle a reporter. He's definitely never had a full press conference like that. Like, yeah, no one has. Is. Not no one, but like a majority of golfers. Yeah, haven't ever been sat down in the Masters media room <laughs> and grilled. But yeah, he was he was cracking me up. He was definitely a little nervous in the. Uh, we got to have him on the podcast. But he was a little nervous. Good luck I think, getting him in Butler Cabin. Understandably, right? It's you, <laughs> Scotty Scheffler, like Jim Nance, the John chairman. Rom. Yeah, John Rahm, the chairman of Augusta National, <laughs> and you're on TV. It's just like, <laughs> look, <laughs> look, you know, right? where do was, I look? Where do I look? That was awesome. But hey, he got to play with Tiger Woods, which is crazy. He beat because Tiger. He had a bad Saturday. Because Tiger, yeah, Tiger's fading. I think he beat Tiger, right? He did beat Tiger. It's easy yeah. to beat Tiger when Tiger finishes dead last out of those well, who made the cut. I could beat Tiger. No, but it's yeah. it, good for him. Good for him. Low am, only amateur. To make the cut. And he had a great Thursday. Shot two under par on Thursday. Did he Both finish them. two under par? I think he might have shot one under for the round or something. And then but. Friday was a little rough, but it was rough for everyone. So because windy. Because the yeah. 60 mile an hour gusts of wind. <laughs> that looked brutal out there. Did you hear all the golfers complaining? They were like, so we, sh- people we shouldn't have played. We shouldn't have. Pl- that was unplayable. I'm sorry. Everyone had the same conditions and you got to be outside. Some- sometimes when golfers complain, it really annoys me. It's also like they're so delusional where like people want to watch you struggle. It's an entertainment product, <laughs> which is how the purses are so big. They're like, I just want it to be a- like a dome. It's like, shut <laughs> up and golf. <laughs> Yeah, John Rahm and then was Saturday like, and Sunday were perfect conditions. Yeah, and they're like, oh, well, you know, it was playing really hard. That's the point. If you want to win, it was the playing Masters, hard for like, everyone. It yeah. was playing hard for. That was the other <laughs> thing. Like sometimes I get it when like the morning tea group has to deal with like heavy sure. wins and it's and it's like, all right, yeah, that sucks because it's not for the whole field. No, from the first tee off to the last eighteenth green, 
everyone dealt with 60 mile an hour gusts. Yeah. It's like, just suck it up and play. Yeah. That always cracks me up when people are like, oh my God, it was so hard out there. It's like, oh, poor you to play Augusta National in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> you know who didn't complain? Neil Shipley. Neil Shipley. Dog. Did you hear dog. Jim Nance? Did you hear Jim Nance give the JMU shout out in Butler Cabin? Yeah, he did. He did um, in Ohio State, right? He got everybody in. He did. But do you think he? Battle. Do you think he? That was a funny. That was a great tweet. <laughs> do you think? Uh, do you think he only mentioned JMU because he just called our final, our final four game, our <laughs> round of HT four game? It's possible. It could have been fresh on his mind, right? That's what I was thinking. He really loves the Dukes after our, us chanting in Brooklyn. He called two games of ours. Yeah. And uh, women's golf. They're seventh right now in the Sunbelt Championship, which goes tomorrow and Wednesday as well, Tuesday and Wednesday. Seventh out of 13 teams, but they're only, you know, 13 shots out of the lead, which is not that crazy for team golf. So let's see what, let's see what they can do, you know. We love that team. Tommy Baker. Tommy Baker. We love Tommy Baker. If you haven't listened, we have a podcast interview with Tommy Baker. Bennett sat down with him via Zoom. I think that's that was right. like two, two, three years ago. Oh, yeah. I think I, I want to say I did it like from a UVA press box or something. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> like during a baseball game or some shit. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it was awesome. We love Tommy Baker. He's completely resurrected the program. And they're, you know, had a great year this year. They have, what do they have? They had one win. They had a couple of narrow, like close finishes. They could have won. Just a really, really good program right now. Yeah, I mean, he did something that Neil Shipley couldn't, which was resurrect the golf program. That's right. That's exactly right. It's an everything school. Was Neil Shipley good at JMU? I think he was pretty solid, but the men's team's never been. He looks like he's taken a pretty significant leap since leaving. Like he also finishing gra- second in the in the USAM. I think he graduated JMU in three years. He did. Smarty pants. Like with data analytics. Yeah. We Nerd. like Neil Shipley. We're Neil Shipley guys now. Nerd. I hope he listens to this podcast. I hope this is how he gets his JMU sports news. And we're just calling him a nerd at the end of our podcast. And he's like, what the hell, guys? But come on. Let's talk about what you were looking <laughs> at. But let's also talk about what I wonder if he would give us the grand reveal of what Tiger. No, we're so, not. We're not allowed to. Ask. We would not ask that. Not online. <laughs> All right. This has gone <laughs> off the rails. This is normally what happens after we hit end stream. Uh, anything else you got to add? No. Nope. Nothing else to add. All right, keep it locked to jmusportsnews.com with the men's basketball, women's basketball portal tracker. Uh, Men's basketball, they still have seven scholarships to hand out. So there's going to be a lot more tracker stuff happening over these next few weeks. Keep your eyes peeled. Potentially Mark Freeman, some other guys coming in. Uh, A lot is going to be happening in men's basketball. Lots going to be happening with JMU football as well. Our guy Daniel Merriman will be on location, live tweeting the JMU spring game, giving away his takes, his takeaways, uh, and and asking the hard-hitting questions of good old Bob Chesney. This has been the JMU Sports News Podcast presented by Bet Online. We'll see you guys next week. Until then, right, go Dukes. <laughs>